I didn't, but he did get to tell the social workers we went hiking in Wales and we had a great time, didn't we, Tracy Number Two? Tracy Number Two was his new name for me. I was Tracy Number Two, apparently. He was going to call himself Tracy. If I wanted my family back, I had to reply, Yes, Dad, it was great. That's exactly what I did. Kathleen Gosling was a key worker who had helped Wenzel with paperwork whilst he was in prison. Later they became friends and used to play squash together. That's the story he told me. He did explain how he managed to type up the life story work and how his spelling was suddenly spot on, even if the information within it wasn't. He said squash was his way of getting the anger out of his system. I soon found out differently when I met her. She was blonde, tall, good looking and married. I could see his attraction, but instantly took it as betrayal to mum. If he loved mum, he couldn't have had other people since, could he? He'd been out of prison over six months since I'd met him, and now I was living with him. Work had to become Saturday only. I was in school Monday to Friday, so he had plenty of free time. Although he always said he was working, I didn't trust him. I wasn't exactly being honest either, though. I'd dropped off at school, walk into reception, sign in, and walk straight back out again. I'd find Cap, Keel or Stoppy and we'd head to their house or the fields. It didn't matter. I just wanted to get away from everything. I was in the living room with Wenzel watching rubbish on the TV and waiting for this key worker to turn up so I could say hi and head to my room to play darts when the door went. Wenzel and I rarely spoke when alone and there was always an atmosphere, one I still cannot explain, just like there was always an elephant in the room. I'd already told him I'd learnt to be a loner and was naturally quiet, so apart from his she's fit, I'd fuck her comments to the TV, we otherwise sat in silence. All Saints were playing their newest song, Never Ever, and generally being depressed. Wenzel was really turned on by how upset the blonde girl looked in the music video. I exchanged hellos with Kathleen and told Wenzel I'd go to my room so we could have the living room to talk. No, it's okay, you stay here. You've never seen my room, have you, Kathleen? He said, taking her through to the bedroom and trying to hide a smile. Mm, no, not yet, she said, with her eyes twinkling. This'll do just fine, she said as the door closed. Judging by the noises coming from that room, they weren't doing paperwork. I went to bed and sat staring into space. This was not what I'd had in mind, not at all. It was only then I realised I'd seen the woman once before. I was with Brenda. We'd gone to a social worker's house for brunch. I remember it, because I'd never heard of brunch before. I was intrigued as to why A1 would have an extra meal. She was there then, on account of it being her house we were at. After Kathleen had left, Wenzel came out of his room and knocked on my door. Yeah, I'm awake, I shouted. So what do you think, he said. I didn't reply. She's cute, isn't she, he asked. Yeah, you two together then, I asked him. Nah, she's married, it's just fun though, he said, doing his belt up. Bro, he asked. Nah, I'm tired told him I replied suit yourself bet you were listening by the door weren't you eh he quit I lay down as he closed the door laughing I was playing streets of rage in my head I was max big and strong when I was walking through crowds of people snapping necks and hitting people with a metal bar I was snapped out of my daydream by my 6am alarm going off it was time for work I had not really slept all night straight after work I noticed Wenzel was driving in the wrong direction this isn't right, I asked him. We're going to see an old friend, he told me. This might jog your memory. Let you see what I've done for you, he added. What, I asked him. You're too quiet. You need to talk more, he told me. I talk, I answered, purposefully pulling the invisible cloak around me and blotting the world out. Where are we going? I asked him about 20 minutes later. You'll see, he told me as we arrived in Wimslow. We passed the park I went to with Mum and Wenzel before I went into care. Remember this, he asked. No, I lied. You came here before as a family. I played frisbee with you, Jonathan and Caroline. We had a nice picnic and a chippy meal, he lied. I don't remember, I lied back. Your mum sat there. She didn't want to play with us, he said, pointing to a swing. I remember that, I said, looking him in the eye, and hoping he knew that I was lying and that I remembered every detail. Hoping he'd just die, or kill me, or do something other than keep showing me remnants of my family. We headed to the bed and breakfast we stayed at when I saw Nan. Barry was exactly the same as I remembered him. He held up a large cactus. Remember this? He asked me. No, I said genuinely. Barry and Wenzel were obviously friends and chatted happily. You gave it to me as a gift. You stood right there and handed it to me, he said, pointing to a spot on the kitchen floor. I'd had only one cactus. It was a gift from my nan. 
As far as I was aware, it had been left at our house in Moral Road in Maxville. No, sorry, nothing, I lied to Barry, shaking my head. I remember bacon, I said, suddenly angry. I couldn't sense Nan here anymore. Yeah, your dad made lots of jokes about my bacon, Barry said, laughing. I looked out the window and could see Caroline and me swapping sweets. If I'd known then what I know now, I'd never have been so mean, I thought. I saw the younger me running through the end garden, looking for my nan hopelessly. Want to see your old room? Barry asked me. No. No point, I replied, not turning around. I'd seen all I needed to. Nan wasn't here. Mom was still dead. I talked to their chat as they sat in the kitchen table. I remember Sandy, I said as Barry gave Wenzel a look I couldn't grasp. It was a question. Does he know? Is it okay to talk? I couldn't place it. Don't play upstairs, Wenzel said. No, I replied. What did you just say? He asked, laughing to conceal the threat behind his words for Barry's benefit. Okay, outside, I asked Barry. Of course, he smiled and opened the door for me. Good to see you back where you belong. Thanks again for the cactus, he said. I stood there like a lemon half an hour whilst they talked. I looked into the pond we'd previously tried to find frogs in with no success. Mum wasn't upstairs like before. Caroline, Jonathan, and Jodie weren't here. And Nan wasn't either. Why wasn't Nan? Where was she? Could she hear me? Pat. What do I do? I asked the pond. Nothing happened. The green shit just floated around like green shit does. Are you here, Nan? I asked again. Once again, nothing happened. Wenzel drove me home, all happy with himself. You've got something else to tell social workers now. We visited a park where we used to play as a family and visited our old friend Barry who had a bed and breakfast. When the social worker arrived... A few days later, Wenzel had placed a picture of Barry with the cactus on a page and had Kathleen type it up as he couldn't spell. An amazing day with Barry. I had to agree to tell the story that everything was brilliant, and I did. It was bullshit. This pattern would continue. We visited Wells a few times to hike, even though most times he just sat in the car once we got there. We didn't do anything, we rarely spoke. There was never any affection, ever, and I didn't want him to touch me. By now I'd become more and more wary of him and more withdrawn. I'd taken to running the Roman walls in Chester of a night because there I could be out of the flat and have a smoke. I knew he'd be in my room every night because my fag packet had always moved when I opened the drawer. He never took any and only asked me the wants. I told him the Louises. I said, I don't smoke. You shouldn't either. They'll kill you. I don't like Louise smoking, but if it stops her getting in trouble at home, I'd rather save them for her, I told him. Why don't you just invite her over then, he asked. I'll ask her, I replied. And I did. Chapter 42 Louise said yes and we went to Chester Zoo together. We were quiet in the car from her place to the zoo and I knew she would know straight away something was wrong with me. Wenzel asked basic polite questions but I could tell he wanted to fish for information. I kept eyeballing him via his rearview mirror and he did the same back. So then I realised I thought more of Louise than I did of my own father. If push came to shove, I'd protect Louise over him. I realised for the hundredth time I really didn't trust him, and it wasn't because of Mum's death. There was something not right about him. People really were like a game to him, to be used, played around with and put down, and if it breaks, well, he'd just get another one. Louise was far too polite to say anything. I wasn't sure what she felt, but I could tell how he looked at her, and it wasn't right for some more of his age to look at her the way he did. As soon as we were through the ticketed gates, it was just us. Louise asked who I was. It's all right? It wasn't all right, but what good could come of upsetting her? We went on the monorail, and both were disappointed that it was so slow. She looked at every item in a jewellery shop, saying that's nice, but refused flat out to let me buy her anything. I wasn't impressed, but what could I say? We went back to Wenzel's and had bacon sandwiches before we headed off to my room. Give it one from me, Wenzel said as I carried the bacon in for Louise. I made a mental note right there and then. She doesn't come again. Louise talked for a fair while, but I can't remember what she was saying. I just recall thinking, I won't see you again. Like Mum, Nan, Alan, Kate, Anne, and it's because I love you. Everything I love turns to shit. Everything I touch dies or leaves. You can't be here, it's not safe. What's up with you? She asked half, turning to face me as I stood in the doorway. It had become obvious I wasn't paying attention. I was, just not to her. 
I put myself between her and the door in case he came in. I was listening for footsteps, trying to figure out how to save our friendship and keep her safe. Nothing, thanks for today, I said just to kill the silence. Perfect day by various artists played twice on the radio in the car as we drove back to drop her off. I watched her lips move along with it both times as the sun hit her face through the window. Wenzel didn't speak all the way. Sure enough, the next social worker visitor was right there in Wenzel's notes. Tracy enjoyed the day with Louise, his friend from care. He got upset because Caroline wasn't there. I'd not even mentioned Caroline. I knew she couldn't come if Wenzel was taking us. Worse, Wenzel, I'd been thinking of ways to have steps at the social services. I'd been doing some thinking of my own. It was kind of always there since he'd lied about going fishing. And then it just grew. It formed in different ways, like a jigsaw. But I couldn't see the complete picture. I could only see parts of it falling into place. And each part felt like a different way. Till suddenly, perhaps I had a quarter of an image. Then I could make a decision. It hit me where he said I'd miss Caroline. Perhaps I should have missed Caroline. Maybe a normal person would have missed Caroline. But I hadn't said I'd missed her. Nor had we mentioned about her going with us at any point. This day was about me and Louise spending time together. And then Wenzel mentions it. It hit me. He was all about him. There was a master plan that he had. I needed to find out what it was. I couldn't do it whilst I had some emotional connection to him. I needed to feel secure. And right then, I didn't. I had a plan. I had to see Wenzel for what he was with no emotion. I had to see him not from his son's view or from his view. I knew both of those very well. But from the view of someone he could attack. Maybe even kill. How could I stop it? What would prevent it? Where would I go? It's the only way I could feel safe. I walked through the school gates and approached the cap briefly looking over my shoulder to check nobody could overhear me. I need a gun, I told him. Chapter 43 What for? he asked as we both bent to sit on the concrete. I know your dad's in a bike gang, no questions. I need a gun. Can you get me one or not? I can try. What if I can't? he replied. A knife, but better a gun. Nothing big. I need a handgun. Something I can hide, like a SIG or G G10 or a Magnum. A handgun. What, he said, shaking his head, obviously having no clue what I was talking about. Just a handgun or a really big knife, I said without thinking. I'll see what I can do, he replied with a concerned expression. I knew he was worried about me, but I also knew he'd trust my judgement. He'd know I was protecting him by not saying why, but then I also knew he'd worry more because I couldn't say. It was a catch-22. He'd either have to trust me, or I'd get my own knife, and they'd not be privy to our chats, and he'd worry more. He'd help me. He always had before. You okay? He said, standing up from where we were crouching on the concrete football pitch. I will be. I will be, I said, hanging my head and trying to convince myself as much as him. You're, um, not going to off yourself, are you, mate? Cap asked, looking pale. I slung my arm around him. No, you dickhead. Thanks for caring, though. I'm not done here yet, mate. Not by a long shot, I told him. Promise me something. He said, not making eye contact. No. No promises, mate. What I might have to do leaves no room for promises. I said genuinely. Just listen. I'm your mate. I've got your back if you need it. Now hear me out. Promise me. If shit gets too much. I wasn't asking because I know you. You won't tell me. You're a stubborn fucker. But if it does, you come find me before you do anything stupid. I could feel his concern like a low humming in the air. Depends what you mean by stupid, I asked, trying not to cry. Cap was still beneath my arm. If you ever feel you want out, to end it, shit, you know what I'm saying, he said, clasping my neck. It's not me you should be worried about, mate, I said, my body suddenly turning cold. But I promise you have my word, I added, feeling like I was talking to Alan again. Hey, stop, he's still got that place if I need it, I asked Cap as I walked towards class. Yeah, man, I'm sure he will, he shouted. I ran back towards him. Tell him soon, man. I don't know when, but soon. Now go and get me that gun, I said, turning on my heel. I'm walking away. I thought about Anne a lot as I ran the Roman walls. My legs were pumping up the steps and past the clock. Down the other side and beyond into my favourite straight. It was night time. The old homeless guy was sat in the shadows. 
I met Holmes girl who called herself Ghost in the subway a few nights earlier. She seemed sound and introduced me to